everyone. Welcome to our scripture reflection for the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. I invite you to listen to a gospel proclamation according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in truth. You are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said to them, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? And they said, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. This is a very short Gospel passage, but it left me wondering, what is it about? And there are several possible answers to that. One would be it's about the conniving, deceitful Pharisees who want to entrap Jesus. Uh, they do so by taking some disciples of the Pharisees and Herodians, representatives of the church and of the occupying Roman government, to pose the question that they believe whether Jesus enters it one way or another, either way they've got him. So it could be about their entrapment of Jesus. On the other hand, this scripture passage has been used also over the centuries to talk about the relationship between church and state. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. And if we look even more carefully, we might come to the conclusion that it's about church-church relations because the Pharisees, who are representatives of the Judaisms of the time, are in conflict with Jesus, who is also a practicing Jew, but of the Judaism of a different sort, apparently. And yet, all three of these answers to what is the story about are really specific instances of something more fundamental that's at play in this text. And what's at play is this. It raises the question, to whom or to what do I give allegiance? And as a correlative of that, uh, to whom or in what do I invest authority? And these are not easy questions to answer. Uh, they're complicated because oftentimes we have multiple allegiances at the same time and not infrequently those allegiances are in conflict with one another. The demands that they make, what they require of us, what they invite us to do, and so we find ourselves wrestling with to whom or to what do I give my allegiance. So I'd like to offer some examples, one from literature, one, a couple from history, and then a couple from just where we are in our place and time to give flesh to the question of to whom or to what do we owe our allegiance, or do we give our allegiance. So the first example I'm going to take from literature, and it comes from Shakespeare, Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3. And in this particular play, Polonius is a character who is giving advice to his son Laertes, who is about to go off to university. And after a long, long list of things that he encourages him to do, he then says this, And this, above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day, that then thou canst not be true to others. Thou canst not be false to others. Is that an accurate statement? To thine own self be true, and then you won't be able to be false to others? Is this the ultimate allegiance that we have? To our own self be true? I think the interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees' disciples and the Herodians 
shows this to be an inadequate response because in the very attempt to be false to Jesus, the Pharisees are being true to themselves. Or to put it another way, uh, when Jesus recognizes their hypocrisy, their attempt to be false, they're actually showing themselves to be true to themselves. Either way, the response is inadequate and in answer to the question, to whom do I give my allegiance, it's too simplistic and inadequate to say, I owe that allegiance to myself, to thine own self be true. Then there's an example from history. Um, Archbishop John Carroll. Uh, Archbishop John Carroll was the Bishop of Baltimore way back near the time of the Revolutionary War and the days thereafter. And uh, the interesting thing about Archbishop John Carroll is that he was a Jesuit, but he was also a slaveholder. He was one who administered the uh, plantations uh, of the Jesuits, and he even had his own personal slave, at least one, maybe more. And by the way, uh, he let that slave go free by a provision in his will, but as long as he was alive, that slave was a servant of John Carroll. So if we look at, at this situation and we ask, to whom was John Carroll giving allegiance, our initial response might be, well, of course, he's an archbishop, he gives allegiance to God and to God above all things. And yet, when we consider that he was a slave holder and complicit in the slave uh, economy, we recognize that he also had allegiances to the state, to other plantation owners, to himself, um, to the economic system of the time. Uh, John Carroll is a good example of the fact that we often have multiple allegiances that conflict and are inconsistent, sometimes contradictory at the same time. Another example from history, uh, we might look at the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance that uh, we take for granted today uh, didn't always look the way it does now. It was written in 1892, and originally it read like this. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's considerably shorter than uh, the Pledge of Allegiance we say today. In 1923, uh, the phrase uh, of the United States of America was added. So now it becomes, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And then in 1954, in the middle of the Cold War, when we were, the, the United States was in conflict with uh, the Soviet Union and communism, President Eisenhower suggested that the phrase under God be inserted into the Pledge of Allegiance one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And that raises the question, when we say this pledge of allegiance, to whom are we offering our allegiance? Especially when we recognize that um, what happens in our positions and practices as American citizens under the government of the United States is not always consistent with what uh, the Catholic Church might be saying and what we believe God to be asking of us. Every time we say this Pledge of Allegiance, we, is, we enter into uh, a conflict of allegiances, a conflict of interpretations about to whom must we give allegiance. And these kinds of conflicts about to whom we give allegiances, we encounter over and over and over again in our lifetimes. Again, it depends on the issues, the circumstances, but they are inevitable. If we think about uh, ourselves today, we can easily identify some of those things. So, for example, I was thinking about um, conflicts of allegiances that can happen in families. And for me, one of the classic examples is uh, the show Everybody Loves Raymond. Raymond is consistently caught up in the conflict of allegiances between his wife, Deborah, and his mother, Marie. 
and over and over and over again, that's the plot line. We can um, encounter conflicts of allegiances when we look at what happens in our wider society. Just recently, militias uh, were making an attempt to uh, kidnap not one but two governors in the United States. Uh, they have allegiances not to the Constitution, but to their militias and to what they envision as the appropriate form of, of governance that they would like to live in. We are attending to the um, hearings for the uh, nomination of a new Supreme Court Justice, and it's no small fact that she's Catholic, and this builds in not just conflicts between Republicans and Democrats, but conflicts of allegiance between her personal faith and her allegiance to the Constitution. Uh, you don't have to look hard to find that our human condition is fraught with issues that raise for, for us the question, to whom and to what do we give our allegiance? And of course, we would want to say God, but it's not always that easy to determine what allegiance to God means in any particular situation. So how do we find a way forward in all of this? I suggest we find a way forward by attending to conscience and to the formation of our own consciences as Catholic Christians. Conscience, uh, simply put, might be that sacred faculty by which we encounter God in our hearts and are able to determine and discern God's will for us in a particular situation. Conscience is that faculty which helps us to understand what allegiance to God might mean as we even, even as we are giving allegiance to other kinds of uh, authorities and groups at one and the same time. Conscience is not something that we take easily. It must be formed. The church says that we must attend in prayer, that we must attend to church teaching, that we must be in dialogue with one another about what we understand church teaching to be, and this is an ongoing process. So what happens is that we, over time, we, we attune this faculty of our conscience so that when we are put in positions where we have to adjudicate between different claims to our allegiance, we have the, hopefully, the, the teaching and the formation of God that we bring to that. It's, I don't pretend that any of this is simple, but I do believe it's part of our human condition that uh, we have to navigate competing allegiances, and uh, even as we are wanting to say that our ultimate allegiance is to God and God's will. So in prayer for us is that uh, we will be able to uh, be deliberate about our attempts at conscience formation, to not presume that we already have it all together, but that our consciences, all of us, including mine, can uh, benefit from additional formation and prayer and reflection. As a prayer for this weekend, uh, I found in the Church's Book of Blessings a prayer for the inauguration of a public official. And I'm using this prayer because uh, it's an adaptation of a prayer that was written by Archbishop John Carroll in 1789 for the inauguration of President George Washington. So, and it seems to me to be a very appropriate prayer for our day and age, but I'm offering it for us as an example of how even when we are in positions where we have conflicting and contradictory allegiances, it's still possible to pray to the one we want to have ultimate allegiance to, to help us through those. So, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed your glory to all nations. God of power and might, wisdom and justice, through you authority is rightly administered, laws are enacted, and judgment is decreed. Assist with your spirit of counsel and fortitude the President of these United States, that his administration may be conducted in righteousness and be eminently useful to your people over whom he presides. May he encourage due respect for virtue and religion. May he execute the laws with justice and mercy. 
May he seek to restrain crime, vice, and immorality. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct the deliberations of Congress and shine forth in all the proceedings of, and laws framed for our rule and government. May they seek to preserve peace, promote national happiness, and continue to bring us the blessings of liberty and equality. We pray for the governors of our states, for the members of their legislature, for judges, elected civil officials, and all others who are entrusted to guard our political welfare. May they be enabled by your powerful protection to discharge their duties with honesty and ability. We likewise commend to your unbounded mercy all citizens of the United States, that we may be blessed in the knowledge and sanctified in the observance of your holy law. May we be preserved in union and that peace which the world cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, be admitted to those which are eternal. We pray to you, who are Lord and God, forever and ever. Amen.